summoned you here for a purpose? Transformyourgame.net Welcome one, welcome all, and welcome back to the 10th episode of the Transform Your Game podcast. My name is Richard, and I'll be your host and moderator today. I'm not alone, though. I'm joined, as I always am, by my three friends and teammates. Kent? Y2K is coming. Are you prepared? Kai? Are are we the bad guys? And Joel? Hey there. <laughs> we're back, and we're in double digits. Guys, we stuck it out to episode 10. How you feeling about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not the biggest milestone, but I think it's cathartic to be able to celebrate some smaller stuff, some smaller achievements in these trying times. Uh, upcoming milestones for us, maybe something like 25, 50, or even 100. You can count on us to be here through then and even more. Uh, today we'll be following suit from last week with our competitive focus discussions, kind of like the round table. Uh, if any of you out there listening didn't get a chance to listen to last week's episode, we did a round table about some potentially very impactful characters from the set as a postmortem for the full spoiler coming out. This week we'll be doing a similar discussion format, but around some of the battle cards. Uh, we each picked a card to bring to the group. Now, we aren't going to all share the same opinion on these cards. We like them to differing degrees, but rest assured that every card we talk about this episode that we bring up, we genuinely believe is going to have a huge or a measurable impact on the competitive metagame. Uh, Ken Nagel from WotC posted an article today stating uh, May 29th is still the on-sale date for Titan Masters Attack. I'm taking that as a good sign. How about y'all? Any feedback? I can't wait. Yeah, it's 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 been a longer wait than probably we've anticipated, but I'm ready. I'm tired of proxies. Let's do it. <laughs> the proxies are tired I, want the, I want the real cards. I really do. I, man, I'm just, I'm I'm ready. But Kent, I've seen your proxies, man. They're excellent. They are like Sharpie on a piece of cardboard, man. <laughs> Handwriting not even a mother could love. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh, man. If I got that like elephant that can paint, if I could like get that elephant to like make one for me, it would probably look better. I, I've seen that video on Facebook, but in all honesty, I can't really tell what the elephant's trying to, to paint. Like, I wish I could, but I, Dude, I feel it's like a it's flower. Like, How can you not see that? It's like kind of a flower. It's like flower esque. Are, are you criticizing art? Uh, from a from an elephant. I'm criticizing art from an elephant. Art, I, 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 did, I didn't know that you were an art critic. Just saying. Uh, well, we're in Texas, so it would be a lot easier to find a horse to paint a flower for you, I think. That's probably true. That's, um, that is probably true. Yeah. Uh, well, in addition to the – I know the May 29th line is kind of like a throwaway line at the end of his article, uh, but I just wanted to point that out that that is still on there, and it's a, an official statement coming from WotC. So I think it's a relevant bit of news. And in addition to that, Origins Game Fair actually announced they'll be hosting Origins Online uh, over an email blast this week. I'm sure they put on additional marketing and advertising materials elsewhere, but that's where I found out about it. Uh, there's no announcement as to whether or not Wizards of the Coast intends to host any kind of online tournament play, but we're hopeful. They said they're using all sorts of digital platforms in order to, to, to let people kind of engage with their favorite types of games. Uh, so we're holding out hope. Uh, there seems to be a good amount of demand in our community for ways to keep playing the game, even under these circumstances, with the Transformers webcam games, uh, with other online things, like uh, with the, the activity in the Facebook group. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, like... I really like to see something from Watsi, but I also know that uh, it can be difficult to kind of get the thing, that type of thing together. Um, oh, speaking of keep, online keep, play... I... Oh, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, but keep in mind, too, that um, Origins, who runs those tournaments, is actually not uh, Watsi. Watsi doesn't put them together. It's actually Pastimes uh, that does. And oh, yeah. I really hope that we get an official digital game at some point from wizards uh for transformers um but in the meantime like webcam games are really good really fun yeah it just feels it, it feels so much better to do the actual physical mechanical flipping and playing in transformers than any other type of digital program like it just it, in my opinion like it just feels so much more satisfying well, and the like communication between you and your opponent and just talking and getting some banter going. And then you talk about either the games you played or cards that you're looking forward to or you make new friends that way. It's really great. Um, it's been very, very satisfying uh, for people that feel that they can't 
play because they're stuck at home, you you can just use a webcam. Yeah, I actually got a message from a friend of the cast, David Burgos, uh, the other day. He was asking me when I was going to finally get you know my life in order so we could play some webcam games. Um, and I did finally – I finally had my setup workable in my uh, in my apartment for a way that I can actually like broadcast everything. I figured out the setup that like it would take for my computer. I need to get a way where I can also like have my face showing <laughs> in the video so I can communicate to my opponent. I don't just look like disembodied hands playing Transformers. But um, yeah, so I, I will be more active going on in, in regard to that. Well, I mean, hopefully we'll get to record a couple games ourselves. I know, Kai, you were talking about uh, doing some stuff once you got your setup going. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we are definitely planning to do some some type of live stream or gameplay videos at least. So. Sick. I'm sure that uh, Shockwave Omega will come back. <laughs> <laughs> In these times, man, desperation, good friends. That, that's good who, friends. That's good be, friends. Right? Um, okay, well, it looks like Gen Con might even still be on. I know you mentioned that earlier, Kent. Uh, who knows? Um, we're being positive right now. I haven't heard any official announcement from them. So uh, we didn't ask for viewer questions again this week because we still have a plethora of them right now. Um, keep a lookout for a viewer questions post next week. Uh, we're going to answer a bunch of the remaining ones we got this episode, and we look forward to the next batch. Uh, if you've got one or a couple for us, you can comment on the YouTube videos or on Facebook in the comments section of the uh, episode post. You can also message any of us with a question if you'd like to stay anonymous but still want to get your thoughts out there. All right, enough chatter. Battle card roundtable time. Joel, you want to uh, start us off with your first card today? Uh, no, I really don't. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no, okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so the first card that we're going to talk about is Tripwire. It's uh, an action, one blue icon. It says, do one damage to an enemy. If it has five stars or fewer, tap it. I think this card is almost just a straight upgrade to Marksmanship in a lot of decks that would use that card. Marksmanship has become a little more situational because you have to have a ranged character, the, the opponent's character has to be in bot mode. There's going to be a lot of characters that don't even have a bot mode now because, mm -hmm. of, uh, because of the Titan Masters. Tripwire. Tripwire deals one damage instead of two. Obviously, that's not as good. And I'm not going to say that, that that extra damage doesn't matter because in a lot of situations it will. But Tripwire will always be a live card no matter what bots you have, uh, no matter what bots your opponent has. And it has that added benefit of tapping a character if it's on a five-star character, and there's going to be a lot of five-star characters. Even if people are afraid of this card, they're not going to stop playing things like Flame War or the Airstrike Patrol or Night Racer. There, there's going to be a lot of instances where this just gets to steal a turn from your opponent. It's super, super powerful. It's got the wrong color pip on it. Uh, but hey, hey, whoa, whoa, hey. Disagree. <laughs> well, okay. It, it actually has a great color pip on it. Uh, because blue just needed a lot more help uh, because because uh, it's the weakest color. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm glad that you've gotten your decidedly incorrect opinion out there. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think Tripwire is phenomenal. Honestly, like what I really need to do is I need to just go take all of my blue shells that I've built for this for this wave and try to incorporate more copies of this card. I think it's not just uh, really good against the decks that were prominent in Wave 4, the Airstrike Patrol and things like that. I actually think this is a card that would have been insane in Wave 4 and is actually just going to get like more share <laughs> going into Wave 5. The lack of uh, bot modes on a ton of the characters is really, really debilitating for marksmanship. I expect to see that this is too, for that card to see way less play. But I think Tripwire is going to be really phenomenal like against any type of Titan Master match as well. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I've seen a lot of people playing Grax <laughs> lately. Yeah. Um, and, Guilty. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's everywhere, and if you're going to play horrible too, you know, like that's going to be the guy left over most likely. Tripwire tapping Grax is, in, is in awesome. He's no defense. He oftentimes doesn't have many blue pips accompanying him. This is one damage. will put him down to four. So you can disable force field, which one of the benefits of Grax is he can actually wear a force field, like if he's at full health. But um, this card's just insane, and it's debilitating to the airstrike patrol. If you if you knock down Tailwind, like 
oh my gosh, they absolutely can't do anything. And Joel, I know you're mentioning that like the one damage um, that you're missing out on is potentially like a big deal. It is against some of the bigger like the bigger characters and um, but if you do things like if you can tap a character and then KO him <laughs> like with your attack or even just get a lot of damage in on him, uh, you're not really losing damage from that. You're gaining damage from that. So it's almost like it can be used to deal like six, you know, like depending on or I guess uh, depending on on what your lineup looks like. Uh, I really like Tripwire, man. I need to find more spots for it outside of just my sideboard. I really, really do. Yeah, this card is absolutely fantastic marksmanship going for around $15 on TCG player right now. I have a couple play sets and that card is definitely going to diminish in value. And we may do a podcast soon about uh, where we think the market is on different cards and where it will go after a release of Tide Masters attack. Anyways, back to Tripwire. I ha- I'm playing right now a Pounce Perceptor Night Racer deck and testing that, and I had Tripwire played on me twice to uh, tap Night Racer, and while I still won those games, it's it could have been backbreaking because I'm losing an attack, I'm losing an a draw, an action, an upgrade, um, a it screwed up my Perceptor flips. Um, it was it was bad. It was really bad for me. So this card is absolutely fantastic. If you need, I, I would immediately replace every marksmanship in your blue control deck with Tripwire right now. Um, it's that strong. It's almost like a free turn if you can get it off. I think some people will regulate, you know, at least a couple copies to the sideboard, um, but it's actually pretty good main deck. It's never dead um, because at least you get direct damage if they have no bots with five stars or fewer. And just thinking about like uh, bot lineups right now, whether you're playing against Titan Masters or any other kind of traditional deck, probably one of their bots is five stars or fewer at some point during the game. Uh, You might have to KO a a body to do it, uh, to get that, but they will be there. Also something, the way this is worded, something to point out is say I have a hollow matter on one of my characters on night racer, and then they do, uh, then they cast tripwire they don't get the damage, but they still get to tap it. The way this is worded, it doesn't say do one damage to an enemy, and then if they take damage, tap them. It's just yeah. do one damage. Oh, wait, it was prevented. Too bad for you. I'm still tapping your guy. In the case of Night Racer, tap your gal. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is this is surprisingly versatile because... Five stars up to until this set were easily the most versatile uh, slot you could put for your character. You could make your team as wide as possible because of the five stars, and they had a plethora of effects, whether you wanted brave, stealth, tough one, bold one, all all this all this stuff. Or, but yeah, this this is already having an effect similar to counter espionage, where pretty much people are looking for decks that don't play five stars or as few five stars as possible because this card it, it's it, it'll blow you out like the traditional big boy blue decks like shockwave and galaxy prime they might be in for a rough time if your opponent draws the tripwire and then well i i guess i have to explode shockwave or galaxy way earlier than i expected to and yeah it's it, it can w- almost sometimes win the game just because of that turn that you steal so yeah this card is really good and probably a little format warping, but then again, we needed an answer to wide, wider decks anyway. So, yeah, I think one last thing about this card that uh, that is easy to overlook is is the way that it reacts with the Titan Masters. Um, it's really easy to to play to play your Titan Masters and hey, the head falls off. I'm I still have this many this many characters, uh, so my team stays this wide. But all of the one star heads. And except for except for Kreb, because he gives plus two health, so he naturally has two health. The rest of the one-star heads all have one health, so th- this will just straight up KO 
any one star head outside of Kreb that someone was using and it even takes care of Styler which is a two star head just KOs the bot they only have one health anyway it's true that's very interesting to note yeah I mean the health heads have been probably the most impressive to me anyway the fact that they are also the most likely to survive direct damage is just icing on on top of the cake for me like uh, the, the health is the only thing that I felt has had like a real, actual, like multiplicative effect. So, when we had an interview with Drew a while ago, one of the things that we asked him was about why Fort Max's second head, the head on Cerebros, doesn't apply to Fort Max as well. And the reason that Drew gave was because he tries to avoid, like the, or not him, but the design team at large, he tries to avoid uh, including multiplicative effects in the game because. They they can make the game feel very samey. They can get uh, they can have really warping power effects on certain types of cards, particularly the double pip cards. And the health heads are the are the ones that have to me. Maybe you guys disagree on this, but the ones that have felt like the closest to that type of gameplay. Like when I played the plus five health off of Grax, like it legitimately feels like it's adding. I mean, it's it's a real ten health, right? Like maybe the, maybe the bold one guy when you put uh, what's his name Parsec or her. Parsec. Is it a he or she? She. Kent? She. Ah, see, I caught myself. Um, but so when she pops off, she feels kind of like a relevant attacker. But the same can't be said for Vorath, her defensive counterpart, is the word I'm looking for. But when Vorath pops off, a two one one or a two one zero tough one, that does not feel like a real defender, right? <laughs> no. So um, and, and the the plus one attack and plus two plus one defense heads don't feel like they're real attackers or defenders either. But um, the health guys all feel like they have genuine impact for the star even after they come off, right? Like, Kreb being two attack and having two health means he just dodges a bunch. Like, he won't even actually die to Tripwire, right? He won't die to Tripwire or to Armed Hovercraft or to uh, the ping from Horrible. He will die to the second ping from Horrible because, let's be real, your Horrible opponent definitely has two black cards to be playing on their turn. But... You know, they have to, or they can't. Or they can't beat them, right? So, yeah, I, I think that's just my evaluation of the heads of the Titan Masters as kind of a group. What do you guys say we uh, move on to Ken's card? Sure. All right. The card I wanted to talk about is Spy Masters Ruse. Yes! 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 Most people already know what this does, but it's a rare action. When you play Spy Masters Ruse, you may play a secret action. Also, while that card is face down, this card and that card are not scrapped at the end of turns. It has a black pip, a green pip, and a black specialist pip, which probably doesn't come in to play all that much. Today, Ken Nagel put out his article about Spymaster's Ruse and, and Pounce and Major Shockwave, and he said, Spymaster's Ruse is his favorite card of the set. And I say to you, Ken Nagel, Absolutely. In fact, it's my favorite card you've ever printed, period, across all waves. I absolutely love and adore this card. It is fantastic. Again, right now my pet deck is Pounce, uh, Perceptor, and Night Racer. This, this card like makes that deck work. It makes it tick. And the fact that you can just sit there with like a heroic resolve on Spy Master's ruse and like, oh, you killed Perceptor? No, you didn't. All the while giving all of your guys tough one and making Pounce bigger, uh, just the, the synergy that lies within that deck is is very, very, very strong. Yeah, I, I just, I can't get over this card. You like should probably grab at least a play set while you can because I think as... It may not be that expensive right away as people still figure out like how it works and the meta and all that kind of stuff. But this card also just gets better over time, like period. And I suspect the years go by and more sets are released. This card will be valued very highly. Yeah, secret actions have always, at least the ones that we've seen in competitive play, have always been incredibly impactful to turn you play them, whether it's your opponent's fearing sabotage armament so they can't, so they don't play an armor, or just hit like hidden fortification. So it's like, I was, okay, so I'm not doing any damage this turn. And even cards in this set that are 
going to be pretty strong, but Smite Masters really just takes all those cards and just bumps them up to a whole new level because not only do you have to worry about them the turn they play it, you have to worry about it after and after that, and then if they didn't play and you played a weapon and then they didn't do any do anything about it, you're like, did, is that still Sabotage Armor Mitts or is it a different card? And then you, it's just this huge mind game that this card just produces, and it just... You, Every time I see Spy Masters Ruse being played, it's it's a it's a feels good moment because you feel safe. You feel safe, and your opponent's just like, okay, well, the wall is now started, and I have to start fighting through this. And that's honestly a really good feeling if you're your control players. So yeah, this this card is perfect. <laughs> yeah, Spy Masters Ruse is a very cool card. It it is uh, you know to be the wet blanket here. It is card disadvantage because you're having to play two cards to play one. There's obviously a lot of ways around that. Uh, like Kent was mentioning with Perceptor, probably drawing you a bunch of cards. Um, it, it, I think that the best use of this card is Lucky Dodge. Uh, no? No, I, actually, uh, Ken's article talked about that, and actually oh, it? it's yeah, I, not I don't think bad. Lucky, it's, I don't think Lucky Dodge is really that big of a meme anymore. No, Lucky Dodge is a meme because of the star, I think. Uh, they're, they're... Wait, does that have a star, or is that... Yes, it does. It has, it has a star. Oh, yeah, it, it star. does. Dang. All right. All right. I think you erased the card from your memory after I we... did. I did. <laughs> yeah, no pips and a star. But it will sit there and save uh, all the damage on one of, your, one of your characters when you choose, if you're lucky enough for it to be taking the correct amount of damage. And you didn't want to use a more a different card like a stratagem or something. Anyway, sorry. Uh, all jokes aside, <laughs> obviously it's a super strong card, uh, really good in defensive shells. Uh, not not quite so much in in offensive decks, but there are some decent orange pip secret actions uh, that that could work in your favor. But usually when you're playing a an aggressive deck, you don't want to be using your action to wait. You want to be using your action to pile on the damage and get the game over as quickly as possible. So that's not that's not really where it's going to go. It's going to go in these defensive decks with with pounce. I mean, it, it's a it's a synergy with pounce is very obvious. So uh, yeah, I think that card was like made for pounce. Yeah, I I actually think that one of the reasons why uh, Lucky Dodge does have a star on it is probably because of Spy Master's Ruse. Now that you mention it. Yeah, it could. I, I mean, I was thinking that card might be really good in that in that case if it didn't, but it's almost unplayable because of the star. Yeah, and the no pips. It's like there's no, there's not really any reprieve either. Okay, so I I want I think there's two things I really want to mention about Spy Master's Ruse. <clears throat> the first is of which is that I can't believe that you like that card more than you like multi mission gear, Ken. I I can I cannot believe it because. They do the same. They do similar things, right? So, Spy Master's Ruse is the type of card that breaks what the game wants you to do. I think that Multi Mission Gear did a similar thing in that what it did was it converted one of your phases into a different phase. Yep. Right. So, what Spy Master's Ruse does is it it breaks the rules of the game. Instead of scrapping secret actions in a turn, you get to keep them in play. You can have multiple secret actions in play at once, which is something very difficult to do in previous iterations of the game. Wave three, wave four. Ever since the inception of them. Um, having multiple kind of situational cards in play to counteract whatever your opponent's trying to do is really powerful, but also very difficult on your hand. It requires specific cards. Spy Master's Ruby, not only is it a good card, an interesting card, a card that breaks the game, it's also a green pip. Yeah. Green pips are so powerful, and this is one of the green one of the type of cards where it's a green pip card that you want to play probably at least two of in your deck if you're a deck that cares about secret actions, really. It's a card that I will absolutely be playing in my limited pools <laughs> because it's a double black pip for my specialist. It's a green pip. Like, it can help me sip something like awesome and play. Maybe I have a lucky dodge in my in my seal pool and a star. Uh, uh, that'd be fun. Um, no, but this card is this card is absolutely insane. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked if this is one of the cards that is like a defining piece of blue base and control decks in the coming metagame. I also think that it, one of the cool things about this card is I actually think it, it can function alongside some of the safety valves they've printed to combat any degeneracy they print in future sets. Right, like this card plus something like Speed Trap or plus like Hijack from Wave 4 or, or plus any of the cards that scrap actions 
um, like the counter spell ones, like infiltrate and stuff like that. Um, this card like it helps to make those more as if they are hard answers to your opponent, as opposed to just basically buying you a turn right of tempo. You can just sit in play. Your opponent would have to have a counter espionage to do whatever their degenerate thing is in, in the first place. So, um, I I love this card. I think it's a one of the awesome things about it is that it kind of took me took me by surprise. I don't know what you guys thought, but like when they they spoiled this card in my head, I was like, wow, I just didn't know they could do that. Like it, it just it just feels like something that is unique. Like it might be defining. I I, I legitimately think that Spy Messengers might be defining, and it is the type of card that's powerful now and is only going to go up from here. It th- this is the reason why like blue is still in the game. This and in hostilities that we're about to get to, it just makes it so. Well, make it so, number one. Make it so, Mister Wolf. Make it so, Lieutenant. Make it so. <laughs> like. I, when they spoiled this card, I mean, I was like total fanboy jumping up and down, really exciting. <laughs> and it has done nothing but make me happy. Kai and I have actually chosen to do kind of a dual discussion. We're calling it, I guess, before the cast, we're calling it uh, Tango. The the Tango, because these cards kind of really take each other to really like uh, prove duality here. Uh, but uh, for our first cards, at least. So in this segment, uh, I wanted to talk about Belligerence, and Kai wanted to oppose that card with its opposite, End Hostilities. I know we, we cried the skies falling when Belligerence originally got spoiled, and it wasn't until End Hostilities got spoiled at the end of the spoiler season. We're like, okay, maybe this guy isn't crumbling. Maybe everything's okay. We're going to be just fine uh, for blue players. Uh, but we decided to do this because both cards are really powerful. They're unique to the game, and... They're interesting in the fact that they are symmetrical effects. The game doesn't like Transformers does not have a bunch of symmetrical effects. There are other games that Watsi's produced that have something like those. I think in Magic, one of the clear examples is a card called Balance. It's a symmetrical card, but it's one of those things like you can abuse it to make it feel as though it is asymmetrical, that one player is more greatly affected by it than others. Um, and Hostilities and Belligerence are very much in a similar vein. I wanted to read Belligerence first. So Belligerence is a card that we haven't really talked about in a while because we're kind of sad down in the dumps that it was a card that existed, but it's an orange action, it's a rare, and it says, until end of turn, each blue either player flips during a battle is an orange instead. (sighs) This card has a lot of really relevant text on it. So not only does it make your blue pips into orange pips, it eliminates your opponent's blue pips um, from being relevant in, in their defense, so tough is actually really invalidated by belligerence. Um, It's until end of turn, so if you have multiple attackers, this is going to apply for all of them, which is kind of insane. Uh, It also turns off abilities uh, that care about the colors of pips flipped, if they want to see blue, or if they want to see different color pips flipped, something like brawn. And it just seems like it's a very low opportunity cost to have, because it's so powerful when you draw it. Um, I would be... I do think that because of this card and others, that aggressive and... um, Early mid, like you know, more aggro-based mid-range decks are probably going to be dominating uh, a lot of the metagame, um, and I think that Belligerence is one of the reasons why. But I do think that there is space for some certain types of blue decks, particularly ones that are built around like a plethora of secret actions or um, kind of generating ongoing card advantage through Perceptor. And Belligerence is going to be an absolute house if those ever really take any considerable percentage of the metagame share. All right, so before we talk any more about Belligerence, let me talk about its counterpart, uh, End Hostilities. It's a blue secret action. Reveal when one of your characters defends. When revealed, each orange either player flips this battle is a blue icon instead. So similar to Belligerence, this basically turns your opponent's attack. Any uh, orange that they would flip turns to blue. So it basically invalidates their attacks for the most part and is basically a safety valve against Belligerence because of the way i believe the way it will work is because this is the last applying effect it will change it over belligerence that's how i believe it works currently Mm -hmm. but we have no official confirmation so that could change i hope it doesn't but that could change but yeah and hostilities is very powerful for a secret action because it can combo with the spy master's ruse to for you to wait for that perfect moment for when your opponent commits their supercharge and or power punch and throws their guy into your guy, and then you just say, no, you're, you're not doing anything this turn. And and it also counters belligerence, as I've stated previously. But yeah, this card is 
this card, Spy Master's Ruse, and probably Tripwire as well to some extent, is the saving grace of uh, the control decks. And even then, though, I don't really know how prevalent they'll be initially because I think Belligerence is still better because of the wheel turn that you get with Belligerence and as well as Belligerence being proactive, where, whereas N Hostilities is reactive unless you have the Spy Master's Ruse, which mm-hmm. you can get because of the green. But if they top deck Belligerence, and they could just go in at any point in time. And Hostilities is, has way more finesse. It's obviously a very good card and very powerful, but it's because of that finesse that you wear is where I think that orange decks are going to just have a sharper edge initially. But that's just my opinions. Joel, what about yours? I think that Belligerence actually is not a good card for the game upon initial looks at it. I, I know I'm the aggro guy, and I'm not just let's go orange and hit people in the face for 15 on every swing, and that's a fun game. That that, that would not be a fun game if, if all anybody ever played in Wave 1 was Bugs. It was just like Bugs versus Bugs versus Bugs versus Bugs. That would be such a boring game. I probably wouldn't still play it. And Belligerence is not a healthy card. I, I would not be surprised at some point if Belligerence has to be banned, even with End Hostilities. End Hostilities is a very, very good card. Belligerence is extremely overpowered, I think. And, and while and while End Hostilities counters it, uh, you have to have the End Hostilities to counter it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of Belligerence. I don't, I don't really like the card. And, I, and I'm not a huge fan of... Uh, of it turn it's sort of turning into like an arms race between belligerents and, and, and hostilities. Uh, as Kent said before in in a podcast before in hostilities was uh, was spoiled. There there's going to be a lot of times where you just lose because your opponent drew their belligerents. I actually had that. <laughs> I and, actually and had that, that. I mean, yeah, that's that, that's going to happen a lot. That that might happen in the. Finals of an event, you're like, okay, here we are. This is a test of skill, and oh, my opponent drew belligerence and just blew me out that turn. So then the game's over. Even if it, even if it's a primarily blue, uh, even if your opponent's primarily playing blue and they and they bring in belligerence, and that blows you out because now everything that they're flipping is orange, and everything you're flipping is not helping you defend, and there goes your big guy or whatever kind of deck you're playing. Uh, and you're just, like, way too far behind and you can't catch up. So I'm not a really big fan of Belligerence. I mean, obviously the card is super powerful. I don't mean it like that. It's definitely going to be important in the meta, but I don't really like the card that much as a as a card in the game. Yeah, it's really format warping. I'm not a fan of Belligerence or in hostilities. Just, yeah, the arms race thing kind of uh, not not my favorite. And for in hostilities to really counter it, well, you better know when they're going to play their belligerence or have it on top of a spy master's ruse if that's going to happen. Um, something to point out if you're a blue control player and you play against another blue control player, what's in your sideboard? Are you going to side in at least two belligerents? Probably. If you're the blue player, and you're playing against an orange player. Maybe they didn't have any belligerence main deck, but what are they going to side in? At least two copies of belligerence, probably. So what that does is it puts blue decks in this position where if you're not running like in hostilities main, you better have it in the sideboard, and you better have like spy masters ruse. Otherwise, belligerence could like end your tournament right then and there. That's why I don't like these two cards. It, the The arms race is just ridiculous. And the fact that, like, hey, I'm playing mono blue and my opponent's playing mono blue. If I'm running two in hostilities in my deck, well, now I need to run three in, for game two. And I need to also side in my own belligerence, you know, and just hope like hope i draw my belligerence and he doesn't have in hostilities in play because i mean the amount of damage that is possible is so game swinging it's the only time in this game that they've printed anything that has made me unhappy like i've played a lot of card games 
I absolutely love this one the most. Obviously, you know, I travel a lot and we all do, um, you know, across the country to play in big tournaments and all that. Uh, and I have praised and loved this game constantly. And this is the literally the only time where I've just been like, oh, man, belligerence made me have a big, sad, grumpy face. And then in hostilities, yeah, it's the answer. But what it does to the game is absolutely game warping. Just the fact that like those two cards exist ties up so many slots in your sideboard. Now, I wish that they weren't as strong as they are if they had like a variation of both cards that was just toned down a little bit. The first thing I want to say is that if we're living in a perfect world, these cards would be flipped on their pips for me. <laughs> Belligerence would be a blue pip and it's supposed to be an orange pip. But um, since that's not the world we live in, I'm just going to talk about cards in the context of uh, them being what they are. So I actually think that in Hostilities is a lower opportunity cost card to be including in your main deck as a blue player. Um, and the reason for that is that I think that blue decks are are historically more likely to be mixed pip than orange decks are. Orange decks are more likely to be linear and streamlined in car in terms of like what types of cards they're playing, the colors of cards that they're playing. Where uh, we've seen blue decks see, see success with copies of Matrix of Leadership in abundance, rollouts. We've seen Energy Pack, Bashing Shield, uh, Enforcement Batons. We've seen things, uh, uh, you know, going forward. We'll see belligerences potentially in main decks that you can turn into blue pips with your end hostilities, right? Like, um, I, I think that end hostilities are going to see more main deck play. Um, in terms of like percentage of archetype, it's sort of like macro archetype. I think that Belligerence is a card that is so... It's a card that carries heavy implication in addition to the fact that it's just good and it kind of hoses something. So what it does is if you're a, a deck that's building towards the very late game, um, let's say that you are based around building an, an insurmountable fortress of tough, whether through hidden fortifications or blowing up all your opponent's weapons through sab, uh, sabotage armaments, or you're trying to establish triple extra padding, something along those lines, uh, belligerence renders that long-term strategy ineffective. Tough as an end game is not effective in a format where belligerence is legal. Now, you can build your deck in respect to this principle. You can play hard defense buffs. You can play cards like Infiltrate or like End Hostilities to try and combat Belligerence. But here's the thing is, your opponent doesn't have to use their Belligerence when you're ready for it. So you have to make so many concessions to turn off this one card. Or your opponent just has to play Belligerence. Like, your end hostility is going to be okay, but there are going to be other situations where they can force you into using one of your better cards against their belligerence turn outside of when they plan to use belligerence, and they can opt into using that card at a later time. And basically, it's up to them. If you don't have enough pressure to actually force them into deploying things in a way that you can counteract them effectively. I love end hostilities as a card, but if the cost of it existing is having belligerence in the format, I think it's too high. Um... There are not star cards in this set, really. Like there, as far as like colored pip star cards, like I've seen Lucky Dodge and a couple other things. But like um, the fact that Belligerence and Hostilities don't have stars on them kind of blows my mind. Based on the power level of some of the star cards we've seen in the past, these seem pretty akin to me. My favorite style of deck is to is to build something that it builds towards uh, you know inevitability, and that's what the uh, Galaxy Prime and the Jetfire decks of the last format really did, um, and even the Shockwave decks in, in the format before that. Belligerence is a card that invalidates that long-term strategy. I don't know that true control can be in existence in the face of this. Um, I think Spymaster's Ruse helps to combat it, but this is the first card since Press the Advantage where I saw it, and I read it, and I thought about what it did to the metagame, and it, uh, you know, gave me pause. All right, well, I think that's going to do it for our roundtable as far as this week goes. Now, um, we will actually be back with some additional battle cards for next week because there are some incredible ones in Wave 5. I think we were talking about this earlier where uh, Wave 5 is just one of those sets where I think the power level is on par with maybe Wave 1. It might be. I think it's better. Yeah, I think it's better. I think it, it might even be stronger than Wave 4. As far as impact, this is pretty insane. Um, 
But I, I will say this. So we've tested it and talked about the upcoming metagame a lot. And we don't know everything, but we do know we really want to get out there uh, to dedicated listeners like those of you. Um, we'll be releasing like the rest of our roundtable, like I said, next week for this. Before we go, we wanted to answer a viewer question. So um, without further ado, um, Jesse Rabitas commented a little while ago on like one of our last posts the following. He said, let's not go another five months without a set. Uh, is this going to happen again? Also, the two-player box sets, the kind of ancillary products, uh, with exclusive characters and cards need to make a comeback, in my opinion. What do you guys think? I really love that idea. I'm one of those people that I would love to see kind of what we had with year one of the game, where we have three sets a year and then standalone products between each set. I loved that. I felt the pacing was so, so, so strong. I can understand that they're taking a slightly different route by like putting some of these titans like Fortress Maximus and Trypticon, making it part of buying a box, which is really, really cool to and that's definitely something to be celebrated but i do like the fact that blaster versus soundwave and metroplex and like that changed the meta both of those just one little small standalone just a couple bots and a couple new battle cards um was really impactful and i enjoyed that immensely it kind of you know gives you something to tide you over until the next set is released waiting for the next set wow that is the like million dollar question isn't it like we've discussed internally like will there be only one more set before the next ei Will there be two more sets with all the current events happening and things being shut down? It's really, really hard to say. I mean, like, are they able to play test internally? Uh, maybe they're doing webcam games. Maybe they already have a digital format that they're using to test new sets. Tons of things that they are working on behind the scenes to make us all happy. Obviously, the the player base that we have is very passionate, but it feels like the game designers are are very passionate too. So I feel like we're in really good hands. It's just what will happen. I personally hope that we get two more sets before December and that there is an EI. I'm really holding out hope for Gen Con. So I think worst case scenario, there's only two sets this this year. I think that's probably realistically what's going to happen. But on the bright side, that means maybe four sets next year because we might get one at the beginning of the year or something like that. But I think just prepare for worst case scenario in regards to the two player box sets. Um, we in, in the interview that we did with uh, Drew, he actually talked about why. They stopped doing those, and that was because they felt the power level not only wasn't at the place where it was, but they also underperformed sales-wise. So I think right now they're working on a way to not only make it more impactful, like Soundwave and Blaster, or Metroplex is actually fairly impactful as well, but make those more impactful so that not only the sales are better, but also the players is also more invested into them. Because I think, first and foremost, it's it's the bottom line. They didn't sell well, so they they should technically stop doing them. But they are looking for way. They did say they are looking for ways to do them better. So we might not see them for this wave, but eventually, I think we will see them again. Obviously, I have no sort of inside track on this sort of thing, um, and I might not have the most popular opinion here. But what I wish they would do is have more sets and less spoilers. Uh, I mean, we. <laughs> I, I like spoilers. Don't don't get me wrong, but but the spoilers for this set have happened so quickly that it almost seems like people are figuring out the best decks in the format, and the and the set doesn't even come out for another month. I, I wish that we would have more sets more often, like maybe a set every three months or something like that. Obviously, these are these are strange times, and and that wasn't possible here. But that that's what I would like to see happen. Just more cards, putting more cards into the format. The format changing more constantly would be great. Um, every time that they've that they put a new the box set, whenever every time they put one of the box sets in, it's had a pretty big impact. Uh, Metroplex had a had a big impact. The Constructicons had a big impact, not because the Constructicons were any good, but Work Overtime was a really 
impactful card, just Reclaim one two. battle card. Do what? Reclaim too. Right, right. Uh, Re Reclaim is also a very good card. Work overtime fit in like everything though. It's it seemed like it was just like it was the very best draw card out there, and it was white, so it could go in orange decks or in blue decks easily. It seemed like. Uh, and obviously the, the Blaster Soundwave deck had a big impact because Blaster became almost the best deck in the format overnight uh, just because of how powerful it was that he could play extra cards and extra stars. So I think those are great. I, I, I would like to see more of those, uh, but I, I think more sets would be great because when Kent got me into this game during Wave 1, uh, part of the way that he sold me on it was that the sets were small. We 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 had both played Magic for a really long time, and those sets are so big, and and you have to have four of each card to play to play constructed, and you only needed three in this game, and and the sets are smaller, and it was just much much easier to to get everything. It seemed like the the game doesn't have to be overly expensive, which is which is really great. That's part of the reason that I left Magic. It was just it was just so expensive to play competitively. Uh, having four of every of every card. So anyway, that that's my thoughts on it. Obviously, I have no insight <laughs> on what they're gonna do, uh, but that that would be my dream scenario. As far as the cadence of products goes, um, I think even you know, Kai, you brought up are the interview we did with Drew and Alasco, um, and I don't. I think that that even he was talking about the fact they were kind of experimenting here. Uh, there were a number of reasons why they were uh, the there, that there was in, originally intended to be a product there was an ancillary product to fill the gap. So, um, and the fact that like that got moved to be one of the in, you know inbox inclusions was part of the reason it felt so long in between. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if there was one more set before EI, and I wouldn't even be shocked if it came out kind of close. You know, uh, I think Packs Unplugged is due to be in early December again this year. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, man, like the last year we had a set come out in November, right? And uh, in Wave Four, I, I believe that's when it came out. And um, I, it, it would make sense to me again if it if it came out in November and like there was not all that much time for people to solve any any type of format before you heading into the Energon Invitational and thus build intrigue. Plus, with the you know delays in both production and development that are probably caused by the whole circumstances of the virus and all that jazz. Um, so while I really don't like the long delay in between sets, I also can't really be upset. I like I, I don't I don't feel like I don't feel like I'm, I or or any of the rest of us would be super justified in being upset with it going on for maybe the next sets release. You know, um, past that I think we can start to express more concern. Um, but, uh, yeah, as, as far as the two player box sets, I think what the, one of the things that the senses that I got when I was, we were talking to Drew was that they were looking for different ways to use that slot of ancillary products, uh, to target the community in a way that is more helpful and better for them and to make, you know, better selling product because obviously they are a business. Uh, and it seems as though the power level of the sets of the things that they were printing or not where they wanted it. Um, they're also, you know, when we talked with uh, John Temple of Pastimes, uh, one of the things that he said was that um, the game is so young that it still is kind of like in this space where it could really use more ways to play the game. Like Turbo, Sealed, and uh, the, the regular two-player competitive formats are the things that are, exist out there. I wouldn't be shocked if so one of the things that Watts is looking into is other ways to play the game. Uh, in order to like, as far as like products to print there, you know, maybe there's some kind of like raid or arch enemy type product. Unicron. Um, Unicron, yeah, that's the one that immediately jumps to mind. There's other, you know, there's other continuities where that could be things, you know, like the Septagod from the IDW stuff, and, um, and I'm sure that there's probably going to be some tie-ins, uh, whether it's products or exclusive cards to the Netflix series that's event that's coming out. Is it this summer or is it next summer? Uh, it was supposed to be this summer. I don't know if it's been delayed with current events, but I believe it was this summer. I think okay. It was well, yeah, my guess is that they have stuff time for release of that show too, just as far as promotional um, marketing goes. Like it would make sense to me. I don't know about you guys, but yeah, would I would love stuff like that. I love tie-ins. I could do alt art stuff too, and like maybe I'm a sucker, but like I'm I'm fine with those 
as kind of like things to tide over the the larger community base. I don't think the two player box sets are going to make a comeback in the way that they have originally. I could see them trying to do maybe starters once a year the same way that they did like the original starter set. It was two players just because I think it's always helpful particularly around like the holidays to give people an in and kind of lower the barrier of entry at the time. Um, particularly like around gifts, stuff like that. But that's really my opinion. Um, you guys have any more thoughts before we kind of close it out this week? I will say I absolutely love Energon Edition, and I hope they continue to do things with that, um, especially for cards that are more difficult to acquire, uh, like the Slipstream and the Cliff Jumper were. It was great that that satisfied a hunger that our community had to get those cards. And then being built out of plastic was, I mean, wow, that was the icing on the cake. I will buy that every single time, even if it was just like common characters. Like, yeah, I would love to see more more plastic cards. Those were awesome. Yeah, yeah. We are going to have, uh, you know, additional roundtable regarding like four more battle cards. Um, as far as our podcast episode next week goes, some four different also impactful ones that we believe are going to be a key part of the metagame coming up. We'd love to hear feedback from you, our uh, valued listeners out there. A big shout out to you, wherever you are. Uh, you can find all our older episodes on our YouTube channel or on SoundCloud, iTunes, and most recently Spotify. Uh, if you found the input information here valuable from us, you can find more like it. More strategy, analysis, tournament reports, and the rest at transformyourgame.net. We're incredibly glad to have you guys here. We'd love any feedback or questions you have for us, and we'll see you soon. But until that time, clear eyes, flip pots, can't lose.